The House finally get a speaker so that it can get back to work. Friday, Ohio GOP Congressman Jim Jordan was nominated to be speaker after garnering support from both deposed Speaker Kevin McCarthy and from Fox anchor Sean Hannity. Without a leader, the GOP has frozen the chamber during several looming crises, from Israel's war against Hamas to a potential government shutdown now just 34 days away. It's unclear if Jordan can win enough support from the entire House to get the requisite 217 votes. In a secret ballot on Friday, he still had 55 Republicans opposed. Joining me now is the person who started this whole chain of events by pushing for McCarthy's ouster, Florida Representative Matt Gates. Congressman, do you regret ousting Kevin McCarthy, given that Israel is now at war with Hamas and we don't have a speaker? Absolutely not. The United States stands with Israel. Israel has a right to defend itself and there is no need expressed by Israel that the United States has not been able to meet. That's because we have an Israel essentially on auto pay. As a consequence of legislation that was passed by Senator Marco Rubio of Florida, the administration is pre-authorized to meet any need that Israel could uh, possibly express in this particular phase of the crisis. My expectation is that we will elect Speaker-designate Jim Jordan as House Speaker next week, and we'll be prepared to move forward with uh, resolutions of support. But those are non-binding expressions of our opinion when it comes to the movement of specific materiel and the coordination on intelligence. We are pre-authorized because our relationship with Israel is that unique. How, how do you think that Jordan crosses the finish line with 217 if there were 55 votes against him, as is being reported, you were there, 55 votes against him on that second ballot last night? Well, I think it's important to understand how that math moved. Initially, there were 81 votes against Jim Jordan, and then about 30 minutes later, there were only 55 votes against Jim Jordan. So on that trajectory, he seems to be gaining a good amount of momentum. Also, it's important to note that those 55 no votes on Jordan were on a secret anonymous ballot like in the basement of the Longworth office building. It's quite a different thing to stand on the floor of the House of Representatives and vote against the second most popular living Republican in America. I know how hard it is to stand on the floor and vote against the party's choice. I did it to extract concessions that I thought were meaningful that unfortunately the former speaker did not live up to. But my, my expectation is that next week we will elect Jim Jordan. Frankly, Michael, I think we probably could have done it last night and I would have preferred that path. But a Speaker uh, Emeritus McCarthy said that he wanted Jim Jordan's family to be able to be there, his supporters to be able to be there. And I guess one thing that Kevin McCarthy and I agree on, Jim Jordan's going to be the next Speaker of the House. You've heard the criticisms, right, from people, including in your own caucus. I think one member who said that, that it's a group of idiots who have led us down this path. Others say we look third worldish at a time when we need to be looking as a model for democracies around the globe. How do you respond to those who say that the whole perception of the United States and the dysfunction of Congress is what has arisen out of your ouster of Kevin McCarthy? I find it a little ridiculous, right? Like, oh, no, the world is ending because the House of Representatives isn't passing ceremonial resolutions this week. The entire United States Senate was out all week. The House of Representatives takes seven weeks off every single year for essentially a summer vacation. There are days when all we vote on are procedural votes and post offices. So I, I think that the chaos narrative is a bit overplayed, particularly in the Beltway, because the lobbyists and the special interests want someone in the speakership that they totally control. They had that in Kevin McCarthy. And just because lobbyists and special interests have been disempowered by the motion of AK doesn't mean it was the wrong decision. And it doesn't mean that like we're in chaos because there were 10 days when the lights were off on the House floor. We have not put our pencils down. This last week, we were getting classified briefings on the evolving situation in the Middle East. I was taking depositions of former uh, and current Department of Justice officials as a, a pursuant to our oversight work. So don't believe that just because there isn't floor action that somehow all of our representatives aren't working. We, in fact, are continuing the work of the Congress. I heard the point that you made, everybody heard the point that you made about a quote unquote auto pay for Israel to the extent there's congressional action required of any kind vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Will you be seeking to tie it to support for Ukraine? Well, no, I'll, I'll be seeking to, to uh, untether any question about Ukraine from any question on Israel. And, and it's important you ask that question because when what we were briefed, mean? 
Well, I think that they deserve their own vote and their own dignity, right? However you feel about Israel and however you feel about Ukraine, I think that a responsible and, and, and reasonable government ought to address those questions separately. They shouldn't be lashed together. For example, I would support meeting additional uh, requests for, from Israel for aid. I would not for Ukraine. So you know, mushing things together, log rolling them, that is the old way of Washington. That's what I'm trying to change, whether it's our budgeting process or our foreign aid. I want individual votes on separate and disparate questions. I don't want okay, everything but mushed together. Many of your colleagues, many of your colleagues don't share that view. Is that your understanding? In other words, th those who seek to diminish United States support for Ukraine are now looking to this Israel issue as a means of doing so. We're, like, unless, unless we get a reduced role for Ukraine, we're not going to support Israel to the extent you'd like us to. That's a sentiment that I'm hearing. Well, it, that is not the sentiment from the administration. The administration is trying to combine the question. I am trying to separate the question. And one of the concessions that we did get in House rules that will outlast Speaker McCarthy is the ability in the Rules Committee to be able to raise points of order and raise questions to try to separate those things. In fact, when we had our defense bill, our $886 billion defense bill, Marjorie Taylor Greene was successful in getting a separate vote on the $300 million for Ukraine because of those single subject uh, concessions we got in January. That $300 million for Ukraine still passed, but it passed with a majority of Republicans voting against it. So now we have, for anyone to move legislation to support Ukraine, they would have to roll a majority of the Republicans who now believe we should be less involved in that conflict, but that in no way diminishes our support for Israel, uh, which is very strong in a bipartisan fashion. Final quick question. What's your answer to my poll question today? Should the Biden administration encourage, quote unquote, de-escalation in Gaza? I knew I was getting this question. I think the Biden administration should be most focused on uh, really putting pressure on Egypt to set up refugee camps and passageways. You only de-escalate after the military operations are concluded. So my answer to the question would be no today, but I think our diplomatic efforts should be focused on humanitarian passageways to get civilians out of Gaza. If we have a pile of you know, dead Muslim kids, that could increase the amount of terrorism in the world, not decrease it, though I understand Israel's uh, very sincere and legitimate efforts to destroy Hamas once and for all. But Catherine, put the social media up there. It's probably a complaint either about Gates or me hosting him. So maybe he'll want to respond. Quote, Jordan is the worst of the bad choices for speaker. Further proof that the GOP cannot govern effectively for all of America. You'd say what to that person at X? Yeah, at uh, X76, I guess I'm glad you're not a member of the United States Congress, because if you were, you'd know that Jim Jordan is a good man, a virtuous man, someone who is broadly respected across the Republican conference, and you know where he stands. That's a distinction between Jim Jordan and Kevin McCarthy. It's one of the reasons I'm so excited to make him House Speaker. Right. But people like me say, hey, McCarthy was willing to reach across the aisle and keep the government functioning. McCarthy was willing to reach across the aisle and raise the debt ceiling lest we would have suffered default. Those are those are good things. Ten seconds. You get the final word. Well, I think that Kevin McCarthy was ousted by Democrats and Republicans because he made multiple contradictory promises that he never intended to keep. Jim Jordan puts us back on a path to fiscal sanity, and he gets the Republican Party back into the fighting posture we need to be in to win elections and push our policy objectives. Congressman Gates, thank you for coming back. Thank you, Michael. Always good to be with you.